I'm so excited that you took the time to join us on the next episode of Beyond the Culture. This is the show where we embrace change and challenge cultural norms and ideals. I'm your host, Dr. David M. Walker. Hey, welcome everyone to the next episode of Beyond the Culture. I'm super excited to have you uh, with me today. And uh, we're gonna have an outstanding conversation. My guest is here, but before we get to her, I wanna just remind you something. Every week when I come on, I remind you to uh, hit the subscribe button. When you hit that subscribe button and you subscribe to the show, every week you get a notice when a new episode has been uploaded for you to hear. So hit that subscribe button and that way every week you can get notified when Beyond the Culture has uploaded a new episode. Also, you can now get our newsletter by going to beyondtheculturepodcast.com. That's beyondtheculturepodcast.com. And if you sign up there, you will get the episodes directly to your inbox. So you don't have to go looking for the show. You'll get it right into your email inbox and you can listen to Beyond the Culture. And finally, as I ask you each week, share the show, share it with your friends. Let someone else know that Beyond the Culture is on. And if you like it, I'm sure they will too. So now that we got that out of the way, let's get into this outstanding conversation. My guest today is Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes. Now, Dr. Barnes is known as the athletics strategist. Uh, Dr. Barnes has distinguished herself as an outstanding professional, community servant, and mentor. Dr. Barnes serves as the commissioner of the Gulf Coast Athletic Conference, where she is, she has this distinction of being the first black woman appointed to this position. Dr. Barnes currently is the athletic director at Dillard University in New Orleans, Louisiana. She's also been a successful women's basketball coach. And I think if I stayed here, she won't mind talking about her family. She's married and she has two children named Caitlin and Mark. I am super excited to have on our show today, Beyond the Culture, none other than Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes. Dr. Barnes, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here. And I'm excited to have you on the show and I'm looking for a great conversation today because you have been someone who's been uh, very active in the sports community. Uh, you've had a great impact in the sports community and I wanna talk all about it today. And uh, so here's what I wanna do. I, wanna, I want you to take us on a journey. Uh, uh, where, did, where did the passion that you have for sports and athletics, where did that come from and how did you get into the game? Man, listen, I, I laugh when I think about it. Um, when I tell, when I, when I talk about passion for sports, I have to take it all the way back to when I was a kid around seven, eight years old, my grandmother's house was in the, her backyard was about probably like a thousand feet from the junior high school football field. Right. So I would go spend, I finish school. My mom taught in Shreveport, which was about, I'm from Minden, Louisiana. It was about 30, 45 minutes from Shreveport. It's about 30, 45 minutes from Minden. So my granddad would pick us up in the evening after school and we'd stay with her until my mom and dad would get off work. But they would have middle school games, football games happening right out a thousand feet in my grandma's backyard. So wow. we would get up. We, Brandy, can we go watch the game? So we'd go to the fence. We watched the football games. Now, I watched the cheerleaders. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to be a cheerleader. I literally, every day I would go and I'd watch them and I'd dream about being a cheerleader. And some people don't consider cheer a sport, but cheer is a sport. You have to be pretty athletic to do all those Absolutely, jumps. Absolutely, sure. Uh, Absolutely. Flipping and all those kinds of stuff. So my my initial passion was cheer. Okay. Then come the 84 Olympics, Flojo is like the most beautiful thing I have ever seen in my life. Um, then it was all of a sudden I was going to be a track star like Flojo. <laughs> Flojo was pretty and she was fast. And I thought I was going to be pretty and fast. <laughs> then I get to like seventh and eighth grade and literally my friends tried out for basketball. 
And I tried out for the team only because I wanted to be with my friends. There literally was no passion for basketball. It was just, I want to be with the cool kids. And this seemed to be the way to do it. So um, <laughs> I joined the basketball team and wound up being pretty good. It's so crazy when I think about it. Um, but I, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed, I think competition is what I love. The opportunity to get out and prove myself. Um, I think that's what I fell in love with sports. It's like the opportunity to make a, you can make a difference, right? With each action you take, if you focus on yourself every day and trying to be better, you can do it. And I think that's the passion that I had for competition. And it just so happened to be that sports was the place I got to do that. Now, now, did you, did you play, did, you know, college, anything like that? I know you, you had the passion, but did you actually play and not that that matters i just i just wanted to you know oh yeah oh, i'm so sorry i feel so bad okay like yeah i gotta think audience don't know me right so <laughs> i played in high school i played basketball i ran track and i was a cheerleader because remember okay. that was my yeah sure club. i uh we did very well in high school we went to, th to state three years in a row um we were kind of a dynasty to okay. say with our team and I was offered a scholarship to go to college. So basketball scholarship, fan track. But I like the sound of the crowd yelling for me. So basketball was way more attractive to me for a scholarship. So I got a scholarship to attend South Plains Junior College out in Leveland, Texas. I spent two years there, then transferred to University of New Orleans and finished my final two years at UNO. So I did play college ball, got a chance to run track at UNO as well. Um, it was a lot of fun too. I remember when I told the coach, the coach that I wanted to run track and he asked me kind of well, what events do you participate in? I did triple jump, high jump, four by four uh, and 200. Those were my favorite events. And I won state in high school in triple jump. So when I told him that I did the triple jump and that I had won state two years ago, he was like, oh, okay. But I felt like he was a really respecting what I had to say. Like, I didn't think he believed that I was really good because I hadn't competed in two years, right? I went to a right. junior college. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I, I told him as soon as basketball season was over, I had gotten it clear with my basketball coach that I could go and run track um, after the season was over. And we had our first meet. I'll never forget. I show up that, that Monday, right after basketball season is over on the track. Coach, I'm here. I'm ready. And um, I said, I want to do, I want to jump. That's, I wanted to do that because that was an area I knew I was pretty good in and I wanted to do the 200. So he started putting me in some, you know, drills that would start working on that. We go to our meet. It was the LSU alumni gold meet. Mm -hmm. I literally broke UNO's record on my first jump. Wow. And all of a sudden I was somebody <laughs> that deserved my coach's attention. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You know, let, let me jump in here because, and the reason why I was um, asking you about your um, your athletic career, because you, you found yourself at Dillard. You found yourself at Dillard University and you, you ended up getting into, uh, you, you ended up taking over their program and mm -hmm. you took it over as I understand. I want you to tell us about that story and, and how did that come about and how did you begin to take over the reins at Dillard University? Man, listen, I um, I have a speech um, that I have crafted and I've done a couple of times called being positioned on purpose for purpose. All right. Um, I, when I moved back to New Orleans in 2003, you know, I coached net at that point for five years. I had been a head coach real young, 25. I had just got graduated three years outside of college. I was a head coach at a junior college. And so I had a number of experiences that led me to believe that mm, I'm going to do more than coach. Okay. But as I was kind of surveying what the field looked like in the administrative space, I realized, well, first of all, where are the women that are leading administratively? First, where are they? Because I don't see them. And then understanding that I was a black woman, mm -hmm. I always felt like I needed the extra, like I was going to. So I came back to New Orleans in 2003, kind of to position myself. I, I said, I'm going to get a PhD because the black woman needs a PhD. You can't, you can't be average and compete mm. again, not get the job, 
you can't be average and compete for the opportunity. So I needed to get as much training, all of the degrees, whatever was needed, at least the, based on my surveying of the field at that time, to have a shot to compete. Yes. So I come back and I said, I'm going to get a doctorate in counseling. You know, I, I thought that would be good because I, I like to help people. You know, that in coaching, there is a, some level of counseling, I, I would say sometimes. But I started taking some counseling classes. And they started telling me I couldn't tell people what to do. And I realized that quickly. Yeah, that's, that's that not wasn't for you once you can't tell them what to do, right? You, you mean to tell me I just got to sit and listen? And I can know what to do, but I can't tell them. No, you're supposed to guide them. Yeah. And I was like, okay, but I've guided them to the point that we know what the problem is, that we have some solutions. Sure, sure. So I realized, yeah, counseling is not going to work for me because I tell people what to do. This is what mm -hmm. I do. I've been doing this since I was a kid. So I, I, I pivoted and said, I'm going to do higher education administration. You know, okay. put me in charge of some stuff. You know, mm -hmm. let me learn lessons in management and leadership <laughs> where we solve problems. And if there's a problem, there's a solution. There's a suggestion that we move forward sure. and we can make it happen because that's who I am. Sure. So that worked out. Um, in the meantime, a couple of things were happening. Over at Dillard, uh, Robin Martin, Dr. Martin now, had gotten hired as the first Black woman athletic director at Dillard. Okay. And Robin was a former University of New Orleans player. We played for the same coach. Um, she was a former assistant coach right before I came to UNO. And so we were connected. We knew we knew each other from the UNO Lady Privateer family. I reached out to her to tell her congratulations. And that conversation turned into an interview. Okay. Well, well, what have you been doing since she left UNO? And I give her the breakdown of getting my master's, becoming a head coach, now coming back, wanting to maybe do administration at some point, working on my PhD. And she's like, well, I'm looking for an assistant, you know, and I wound up going to work with her. Um, okay. So in 2004, 2004, 2005, I was her assistant coach at Dillard. Well, in 2005, you know that Hurricane Katrina hit um, and, you know, decimated New Orleans. And in October 31st, 2005, I received my letter saying that I was being released from my mm. duties at Dillard. And I was pretty upset with God about that. And I was <laughs> upset because I said, I told you I was happy over here in higher education administration. I was working in housing at UNO. I, I had started to see myself potentially as taking a different route to be maybe a dean of students to work right. with student activities. I was like, I don't have to just work with student athletes. I can work with the whole student body. And so when the opportunity to go and work with Robin came, I prayed about that. And he said, go. So I was like, okay, I'm going. But now I'm a year later without a job. And now I'm just doing school and I'm really upset. I, I, at this point, I don't have, um, they had left, Robin was all alone. So it was really crazy. They let the whole department go except for the athletic director. Understandably so, we didn't get any tuition that semester. I mean, it makes financial sense, but emotionally, Right. Ooh, it still just hurt so bad. And I was just so angry because I was like, I could have just stayed at UNO. I wouldn't even have to go through any of this. Only to turn around in 2006, about a month, I think, before school started, Robin took another athletic director job okay. in California. And now Dillard's trying to rebuild. They're moving back in a hotel. You know, they're trying to figure this thing out and they're looking for a leader. Okay. Well, guess what was the number two? me i was robin's right hand so for the president who had just gotten hired july 2005 she hadn't been on the job a month before the before katrina hit and hasn't had enough time to really know anybody it was it was easy i was positioned on purpose like i was wow. right there sure i love that purpose. i love that position on purpose but go ahead that's that's powerful right there it is because what happened was what I didn't see, I didn't know that I was being positioned on purpose. I didn't know that I'd be athletic director at 30, 31 years old. I thought that once I got my PhD, worked for somebody for about 20 years, I'd be 50 years old by the 
at the opportunity that I would have a chance to compete right. for an athletic director in that job, not actually obtain it. Right. I'd be prepared. I'd have credentials and I could get in the game and I could compete. And so God positioned me purposefully for this time. Now, since, you know, that I guess the past 17 years now that I've had it, Dillard, what I have learned in self-reflection is that I'm a builder. Okay. That's what God created me to do. Every job that I've had has been a job where I had to build it. My very first head coaching job at 25, three years out of, out of college, was a program that they were trying to rebuild. And mm -hmm. they were looking for some young blood, as they say. We want a young, young person with some energy. Well, I, I fit the bill. I had plenty of energy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had plenty of energy. Uh -huh. um, but hard as well. I mean, I had proven I was smart. I had my bachelor's. I had my master's degree, developed good relationships. And they gave me a shot. But it was a rebuild. Right. Wow. So, wow. So wow. You, you, you never realize we, we are prepared for things. And when I, when I'm in church or, you know, when I'm in spaces where I can talk about the power of God and the power of choice, mm -hmm. you know, I'm often talking about, I, I move from assignment to assignment. So every job for me really has been an assignment. I was, I was led there for purpose. And once the purpose had been fulfilled there, things would happen to let me know it was time to move. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. For those of you who are just uh, joining in on this conversation, I'm talking with uh, Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes, and she has uh, joined Beyond the Culture. Uh, Dr. Barnes, let me let me ask this. How, you said you were there 17 years as the AD? Uh, 16 as athletic director. And, okay. Yeah. And okay. one year as assistant basketball coach. So 16 years as the athletic director, you, you have now taken over this program. You had to rebuild it. As you said, you, God has put the, uh, the assignment of building, you know, <laughs> building community, building relationships, you know, uh, uh, bridges. Um, so now you're at Dillard, you're the athletic director. You've had a 16 year tenure. And I want to ask you, what has been your greatest challenge about being an athletic director? My biggest challenge? Oh boy. Um, biggest challenge. Honestly, the biggest challenge for me has been accepting who I am as a leader, okay. stepping into that. I like challenges. Okay. So, and when I say I like challenges, like it was hard you know, finding space. I mean, there were things that were a part of the job. Like we didn't have a facility when I first started. So, I mean, it was really hard because we're practicing all over the city. Uh, that was a challenge. Uh, getting the right team, that was a challenge. Um, you know, uh, developing a, a, a basketball program that was going to be respectable, that was a challenge. Uh, gaining the respect of my colleagues and earning trust, all those things were challenges but all challenges that I eventually overcame it to me wouldn't seem as great. That comes with the build, the mm, rebuild. Right. But the, but the challenge, the, the most important challenge for me was understanding how I was supposed to lead. I was 31, most, uh, mostly men, a male dominated space, trying to understand what it, what it looked like. How should I lead? What was appropriate for me as a woman to be in the space, um, how I should look in the space. You know, I remember I make jokes about this all the time. I wore black suits, white shirt for the first probably six years of my, 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 my leadership as an AD because, and, and a bun. I did not <laughs> want to be seen as the pretty face in the room. I wanted right. to be taken seriously. Sure. So I was very strict um in my dress i remember being very dictatorial in the beginning of my leadership journey because most of the men that i worked for or played for were very dictatorial to me okay you do this the way i say it because i said so 
and you don't and you don't challenge. Right. Okay. So I mean, if, if you say do this, then I'm gonna do it as long as it's not unethical, right? Mm-hmm. You know, sure. but within reason. So I, of course, am now trying to do the same thing and I'm getting rejection. Like people are, you know, kids were disrespectful sometimes and I couldn't understand. I was like, I would never, I would never yell back at my coach. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't matter what they would say to me. Like I would never say a word back. I can't understand why I can't challenge them. I can't get in their face the way people got in my face. It never, it never bothered me. Um, and if it did, I just learned to get over it, right? I could never understand why I couldn't interact with people that I was supposedly in charge of in the way that people did to me. Mm -hmm. And so that was a huge challenge. And so at some point I started realizing like you have to become comfortable with who you are. Right. I am collaborative and actually a lot of fun to be around. (laughs) I hear you. Um, I'm a, I'm a lot of fun to be around and a lot of fun to work with. Now, I will work you to death. Mm-hmm. Anybody who has been in my space will know when I'm having fun, like the fun can go on and on and on and on and on. And people are like, I'm tired. It's like, but we still got this one thing we got to finish. So come on, I'm going to put some music on, we'll buy some food, let's get it done. <laughs> <laughs> yep, but definitely. Yep. I was extremely demanding. I learned how to still be demanding and set high expectations, but I had to do it my way. Okay. And that was my way. And when I was able to finally settle into that, that's when you saw influence for me grow. People start to buy into the vision that I had shared um, and things that we were trying to do. And you started to see growth within the department, but I will say that was so hard. And when I, talk to other coaches, other administrators, young people who are looking to leave. That is normally the biggest challenge they're having. It's not the actual job. Right. You can do the job, Mm -hmm. but it's the inner work. It's the inner work and knowing why you, why you exist and for what purpose you exist. Challenges are hard. So if you don't have the connection to the purpose, it makes the work that much harder. You know, I love that what you just said about um, understanding your purpose, why you exist, what you were called to do. And I think I kind of, this is what I got from you when I asked you about challenge, it, it, it challenges. It seemed like it was a little difficult for you to think of something real quick because it sounds like because you're in your purpose, even though you have these challenges, you, you, you work through them and they may not be as difficult for you as they are for other people looking at it. That's right. Yeah. It, it is so that is very, very accurate. That is extremely accurate. If you talk to people that are operating in their gift and in their purpose, you will get the same response. Right. Because the purpose and understanding your purpose also informs your perspective of mm. what a mountain looks like. Like it may be a mountain to somebody else and it That's may right. be healed to me. That's right. Exactly. I totally agree uh, uh, with that. And I've oftentimes said, you know, sometimes when people look at you in your gifting, they think it's easy, <laughs> but they don't realize you've been conditioned for that job, that position, that duty And it's not easy, but because it's your purpose, your understanding, sometimes some people will think, oh, I can do that. I can just step in and I can run an athletic program. I could be a coach, you know, all this kind of stuff that people do from the stands and the sidelines, right? (laughs) And I could, if I had a dollar for every person that has has come up and told me what they would and what what I should be doing, (laughs) and if they were... If they were in charge, they were doing bad. I'd be a millionaire right about that. I'd be buying Twitter. I know that's right. There you go. There you go. You're absolutely right about that. But let me shift here because you you have just recently uh, taken over the position of the commissioner of the Gulf Coast Athletic Conference. And as I said earlier, you now have the uh, the distinction of being the first black woman appointed to the position. And when I saw that, uh, uh, something 
jumped out at me and I hope you don't mind me allowing my brain to uh, uh, process it and, and say, hey, wait, maybe something's going on here. So here, here, here's what it is. Um, we've got Kamala Harris as the first black woman vice president of the United States. And then we have Katanji Brown Jackson as the first uh, United States Supreme Court justice. And now we have Kiki Barnes as the first black woman commissioner. Uh, I think if I have a, another daughter, I'm gonna have her first name to begin with a K because there's something about that K. <laughs> Kamala Katanji and now Kiki. Uh, you are the first uh, black woman to take that position. How does that feel? Man, listen. <laughs> first of all, I like that analogy. I never thought about that, but now we have to share that. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. Like, so first of all, I've been interim commissioner for two and a half years and athletic director. So okay. I have been since 2008, I have served the GCAC in some leadership capacity. From 2008 to 2019, I mean, not 2019, to 20, oh man, oh boy, I can't remember. I can't call it right now, but for at least 10 years, I was the president of the conference. Okay. Um, and during that time, there was a semester I served as the commissioner. They, I didn't get the title. We didn't say it. My, our, our current commissioner at that time was a professor. Um, he had been with the conference for 30, 30, 30 years or so. He had put his resignation in and he was preparing to go teach abroad. And so he basically said, I put my resignation in. I need you to work with the presidents to move forward. I'm not going to be here the next semester. Here's what you need. Here's everything I have. Here's what you need to do. And good luck. So that was the semester, either I think 2012, 2013, the spring of where I literally ran the conference while he was overseas. Mm. Um, and I helped lead the search for us to hire our next commissioner. And we hired a person right after that. I think I stayed on as president for a couple more years before I stepped down and gave it over to another colleague. Um, and for about two, three years, I was free from the conference work until uh, the, the second commissioner we hired took another job. And then the president asked me to step back in as interim. Of course, we thought it was gonna be a, a six month deal, um, but then it of course turned into two and a half years, COVID, a number of things. Um, and here we are now, They we were kind of at this, what do you wanna call it, a fork in the road, where we're trying to determine what we wanna see happen with the conference. The conference this year celebrated 40 years of existence. And in 40 years of existence, they had never had a full-time leader. Okay. And so the presidents decided, we want to see this conference move forward. We understand that it needs a full-time leader and we are prepared to make that move and that commitment. And so um, we, of course, had some conversations about what that could look like for me, because at that point, remember, I'm still full-time at Dillard and I'm... <laughs> kind of holding this thing together, you know, uh, treading water, if you mm -hmm. want, if you will. And um, we were able to work it out where I could move on towards uh, to, to take the position full time. And so, um, I, you know, when I started as a leader in 2008, the emphasis for me becoming president wasn't about being a trailblazer. I was the first black president for the conference, two black women president, but it, it wasn't about being a trailblazer. It was about earning respect. Okay. So my very first meeting at the GCAC, I was asked to take the minutes in the meeting. I was the only woman in the room. As the president? And when someone, as the pre I wasn't the president at the time. Oh, okay. My very All right. first meeting, uh -huh. my very first meeting as a young, Black woman athletic director, the only woman in the room. I got you. My very first meeting was, oh, Take we're having minutes. a meeting with the athletic director. And some they asked for someone to volunteer. And when no one volunteered, the chair turned to the woman in the room and said, why don't you take the minutes? Wow. So I had, I had a decision to make. I had to decide whether I wanted to cut up 
or whether I was going to just take these minutes. But I could tell you internally, uh -huh. I had decided at that point that I was going to be the next president. Okay. And I was going to take these minutes and I was going to do it very well so that whoever was serving for me would know how it's done. And so when I took the, in, the first initial leadership position in the conference, it was about me earning respect. Um, the commissioner opportunity wasn't about trailblazing. It's about building. Right. So, for, for, so, the, thing, so the, the things that move me and why I move is because there's a, an assignment that I've been called to do, and then I just have to do it. And so it's really weird because it's like, well, I'm trailblazing, but that's not the purpose. Mm. It's not my purpose. My purpose is I was created to build. That's, that's what I do. I can, and it doesn't matter. I could do that at church. I could go to church and be a part of a ministry. I'm not even trying to be in charge. The pastor will decide they want something new. Kiki. We're trying to create something new. <laughs> I'm going to get that. I'm going to get the call. People who can see it that I'm going to, if it's something new and it needs to be created or built, that's what I do. Right. So, it, so basically for me, it hasn't been about trailblazing. It's been about building and making a difference and making things better than they were with the gift that God gave me. And on the flip side of that, there have been rewards that have come with that. Okay. Rewards of being the first, rewards of being acknowledged by peers. And so, and there, so there are so many blessings that have come with it. And um, when I talk to people about leadership and what you always talk about, your gift being your blessing and your burden. Mm -hmm. Because the burden is you being committed to being the best at what he's created you to do. So I'm trying to be the best builder I can be. So what I have to do for GCAC that I didn't do for Dillard is I have to do it faster. Okay. Like I, it took me 16 years at Dillard. Oh, I can't take 16 years with the GCAC. <laughs> I got to perfect it. Sure. Right. So I've learned tons of things because I messed up a lot of stuff, right? I didn't do everything right. Um, but I learned different ways to use my gift. Mm -hmm. And so I gained influence. I learned how to work with different people. I have a different knowledge set. I've expanded relationships outside of the Dillard community now within our national association, within the city, within the country. Now I have to take all that I've learned in this first assignment. And now I have to apply that to this assignment and we got to get to the goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's my thought about it. Let, <laughs> let me ask you this because you, you did say you made a lot of mistakes and uh, what what was the, the worst piece of advice you got in your journey? And you said, I'll never take that advice again. <laughs> Can I be honest? <laughs> Please be. I don't, I don't listen to what people have. To, I don't listen. Okay. Like I... So I, I, like, and this will sound really funny, Okay. but I, I, if, if you talk to my mom, my mom would tell you I was very hard headed. People will tell me one thing. And if I have decided what it is in my head, I don't listen to what people have to say. Okay. Um, because God told me to do it. So I just kind of feel like, well, if, if I have heard from almighty, like you can't tell me what I can't do. Right. Um, which is, and, and let me say this. So when I talked about this whole thing with me trying to figure out how to lead, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I will say that maybe people would share things because I don't, I didn't ask for much advice. Like I talked to my mom. I just, I don't know. I really didn't ask for a lot of advice from people, but I would like to share, like I'm going through this thing. Tell me your thoughts on it. And I may listen and I may have listened. I try to find the thing that I feel like will help me. And then I move. So I have, let's say selective listening. Okay. Let me say that. All That's, right. I, was like that. I don't listen, but I have selective very selective listening. listening. I got to write that down. Selective listening. I am, I am a selective listener. <laughs> and I learned that 
from basketball, right? Sure. Coaches yell and cuss and fuss about everything. And with if your coach is yelling and fussing at you all the time, it affects you mentally. And so I needed to perform, right? And sometimes what coach had to say made sense. And sometimes what they had to say didn't make sense. And it didn't make sense because they weren't on the floor. I was. Right, right. Like, and I, I felt this way as a high school student. And so if I thought what they were saying didn't make sense based on what I was experiencing on the court, then I didn't need, I didn't do what they said do. Now, <laughs> now I will say this. I also do that if I was going to go against something coach, like a play coach call, if I was going to do something else, I also understood that there were going to be consequences that were aligned with me not successfully either getting a basket or breaking the play. You know, if it didn't turn into a positive for us, then I also knew that could jeopardize my relationship with my coach and my position on the team. Mm -hmm. But to me, and, and when I, when I would coach my young people, that's why you work really hard. Like I, I even as a young person, I believed in myself and I learned not to hear stuff. Okay. I learned not to hear certain things. I didn't receive them because I was like, it don't make sense because they're not here. I am. And I know they can see, but so can I. So this selective listening started as a player blocking out negativity and craziness from coaches that didn't make sense. <laughs> and the stuff that did make sense, I kept that and moved forward. Well, I kind of carried that forward into my professional life. Okay. I'd be talking to people about something and they may say some things to me and I hear the things that made sense and the stuff that didn't, I just discard. Um, so it's real hard for me to really sit here and think about what piece of advice that they give me, because if it didn't make sense, I didn't even receive it. I just didn't, I don't, I don't, I don't listen. I have selective listening and the things that will make me move forward, I receive and things that don't support where I'm trying to go or sound crazy. I reject. I don't even remember them. You you know that's a that's an excellent observation. I love the term uh, selective listening, and you know I've heard obviously we all know about that what what it means. But I love the way that you put it in the context of of athletic administration leadership, um, even well to do people, knowledgeable people everything someone says is not useful it's and not. you yeah and you have to not just say well you don't know what you're talking about that's not the direct response to it it's to as you use the term discern what's being said collectively and then mm -hmm. ciphering out what's really important for you to know yeah. and then you take that and then you move forward and that's where your success will be versus just rejecting someone completely because it's a part of what they're saying you don't agree with. And I see yeah, that that's a part of your leadership. Never, yeah, and I was never disrespectful now. So let me let me clarify for the listeners that's listening. Now, I wasn't disrespectful to my coaches. You gotta so get that right around, <laughs> I never talked back. I never told them that I thought what they said was stupid. I just mm -hmm. simply didn't receive the instruction. Yeah. And I did something else. <laughs> Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And I will say this, that I probably 90% of the time was right. When I, when I made my, when I made a call and what happened was trust between me and the people that entrusted me with leadership grew. They could trust me. They trusted my instinct. Right. Even if they thought something different, they learned to trust my instinct. But I will also say that as a young person, I was preparing to be able to do that. I was preparing to take the risk in practice every day. I went 110%. I didn't take breaks. I didn't cheat. I believed in doing like not taking shortcuts. Like that was something as a student athlete, as a young person that I learned, you don't take shortcuts. You do the work, you study. All of those things will help you eventually make better choices or be able to perform under pressure versus not. And that started in high school. And so when I had to take that risk on the court, even though coach wanted to go a different way, most of the time I succeeded. So the more I succeed, the more goodwill I build with my coach 
and I also build more trust, which means I get more responsibility and a little bit more grace when I do get one wrong. Mm. If I'm not, I'm not getting pulled out immediately because I've made four out of five correctly. Right. So if I miss the fifth one, it's like, ah, oh, it's okay. Cause she's going to get the next four right. before she probably misses another one. And so I have carried that, like all of that started on the court. And so when I'm talking to young people about how they practice, how they show up, I'm like, literally, I said, you're training yourself for success. So if you take taking shortcuts now, when it's game time, you won't be able to perform. You're not prepared for the pressure. You're not, you haven't done the work to be prepared, but you want to blame it on the coach. It's right. the coach's fault. No, it's your fault because you ain't do what you needed to do. Nobody wants to step ex- responsibility for their own actions. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I am, I will say that I am pretty tough. Like when I start thinking about leadership and being the best you can be, like, I just don't believe in the excuses. Um, I believe that the only thing we control in life is our choice. Mm -hmm. We don't control anything else, how we choose to show up every day, how we choose to respond to issues, how we are challenges in our way. That is totally under your control. Now you don't control everybody else, but how you respond is the only thing you have control over. And if you decide you're going to give it to somebody else, that's on you. For those of you who are just joining in, uh, you're listening to beyond the culture. And my guest today is uh, the commissioner of the Gulf Coast Athletic Conference, Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes. Uh, doctor, you, you just said something about uh, leadership and you have a program, uh, it's a coaching and speaking business uh, focused on helping others unlock their potential. And then you're also the founder of So You Wanna Be, So You Want a Career in Athletics. It's a professional leadership development program designed to expose girls ages 13 to 18 to career opportunities in sport. Why is this program so important to you? Oh man, it's important because I want young women and I've expanded my program to include college young ladies now. um, But I want young ladies to walk into their opportunities with confidence. As we spoke a little bit earlier, you know, I spent the first six, seven years as an athletic director just trying to, who am I as a leader? Um, I had never seen someone like me lead. And when I say like me, funny, (laughs) loves to dance, a kid at heart, um, loves to collaborate, doesn't have to be in control of everything. Uh, likes to involve people. I hadn't experienced that leader. So because I had not experienced that leader, I did not know that that kind of leader could be as successful as the leader who was dictatorial. Mm. And so once I finally kind of settled into this, listen, you can only be yourself and you have to be yourself. And when I settled into being authentically me as a leader, that's when life changed for me. That's when people began to buy in. That, that's when the success came. And so what I want young ladies to see is just the way you were created is good enough. And they need to know that at a young age because young girls are usually, self-esteem is a major issue with young girls. Mm-hmm. Major issue, especially at that age. They're trying to figure out who they are, where they want to go, what they want to do. And you have to be settled on believing in yourself first, okay? Right. Then all the other stuff can happen. But if you don't believe in yourself, then that makes it 10 times harder. And they also need to see different representation of leadership and understand that this way of being is also a pathway to success. So you don't have to change who you are. You don't have to become this mean person that's very cold that's standoffish from your team you know you try to keep those relationships you know just strictly you know I'm the boss you report to me it doesn't have to be that way for you to be successful at leadership and that is um I think the heart of where I want to be uh where I want to see young women 
in terms of stepping stepping into leadership roles. So that's why it's so important. Um, again, I'm so happy. I'm in such a good place because I'm being me and I get to lead with all the happiness <laughs> and positivity that can exist. People who are in my space, they are better people. Um, they, they learn to be more open and accepting of people who aren't like them. Now, everybody's not like me in my space. Like there are some people who are like, okay, she's just on 100, but they, in, <laughs> they, they enjoy it. So, I mean, but everybody in my space can be uniquely themselves and affirmed as the person that they were created to be. And so I think that them seeing good, inclusive leadership examples will help them help others and help themselves. So that's why it's really, 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 really important to me. You know, Dr. Barnes, we've had a great conversation today and I, I really want to thank you for uh, taking the time to come on the show and you are a, a, a bright light, you are a shining star. Some people call it a North star. Uh, your, your journey has been one that uh, you should be a proud of. And I know you talked about your mother earlier. I know she's proud of you, you know, um, <laughs> and uh, because you've done so many things, you've impacted so many people. So I'll tell you what I want to do as we close. I want you to first give us um, your contact information. So if any of our guests want to know how to connect with you and contact with you, they can do that. And then after you do that, I would love for you to close us out with just a word of motivation to, to our listeners. Oh boy, good one. So listen, please follow me on all social media platforms at Kiki Baker Barnes. Um, I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook, and it's at K-I-K-I-B-A-K-E-R-B-A-R-N-E-S. My website is www.kikibakerbarnes.com. And my girls program, So You Want a Career in Athletics, is at S-Y-W-A-C-I-A on all platforms as well. So those are ways you can reach out to me. Um, and my email information should be on the website. So if you click there, you'll you'll get to sign up um, for my email list and I'll be able to connect with you. Um, I'm trying to think about how I wanna, how to, how I wanna close this out. I think the most important thing, um, if you are looking to lead, you're looking to make a difference is to really reflect on who you are and what value you bring to this world. Not your title, not your position, but what do you bring? Who are you? I am a builder and a creator. And when you can get to that point, then you can figure out how you can live out your purpose in any circumstance. And so I would just encourage you to continue to search, to be open, um, and to give your best effort. Dr. Barnes, I want to thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. And as I say to all of my guests, you have gone beyond the culture and I thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Now, if you want to continue to hear inspiring interviews like the one you heard today, I want you to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite streaming platform. Also, rate the show and please leave a comment. I would also love it if you would share this podcast with your friends to let them know that we're on. Finally, you can email me at beyondtheculturepodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. This is your host, Dr. David M. Walker, and we'll talk again on Beyond the Culture. Take care.